got to lose them but cry. But all our hearts, our souls, our minds, our faith in Him. So why are you so? What the Lord is after, completely yielded to the Father's will. It's not enough to hear the word, but we've got to do what we've heard and let our light shine to all men from on top of the hill. So are you so? All right, good evening, my church family. I'm Pastor Chris. This is Crossover Church of God in Old Town Clovis, coming to you tonight exclusively by live stream. We're not meeting in person tonight. Um, you probably saw that announcement that I made on the Facebook page and the text messages going around. Uh, just want to give you a quick update on that. I, I announced this last week that uh, based on what we were seeing, happening locally and even nationally, but um, especially locally with the uh, post-holiday uh, 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 the spike, that's, what, that's the word I was looking for, the spike and the uh, COVID cases because of the Omicron variant. Uh, they even have a name for what was happening. They, call, they were calling it, uh, they're calling it now the post-holiday COVID bump. Uh, which was last week and into this week. Uh, so we, we um, canceled in-person services for the week just to be error on the safe side. And we did that Sunday. We met remotely Monday night for Celebrate Recovery and we're uh, doing it tonight too. I'm just coming to you via live stream. However, I have been watching the local uh, news and looking at what's happening here locally, what other churches are doing. By the way, in our own denomination, there was a uh, church recently that had a 90% positive rate of COVID. So <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not playing around with this, guys. Your, your health is too important. And uh, we were erring on the safe side this, this week. Now, so here's an update. This is the way I want to I do it. Starting this Sunday and probably through the wet rest of January, maybe. We'll just kind of watch it. But we're going to return to in-person meetings 
for Sunday and Wednesday night Bible studies, but with restrictions. And here's the restrictions. Here, here's the point. Um, we're going to, by the way, I also, uh, I'm saying by the way a lot. It sounds like I'm all over the place. Um, Fresno Unified just today announced that this next week they're going to return to in-person classrooms uh, with uh, restrictions. So I'm kind of following what some of the other um, school districts and other churches are doing. This next Sunday, we're going to meet with restrictions, and those restrictions being uh, please wear a mask into the building and to your seat. Once you're seated, you can take it off just like in a restaurant. Uh, but please wear a mask. I know you, many of you don't like to do that, but please don't, please uh, just cooperate. We need your cooperation with this. This is just going to be a short season that we're doing this. This Omicron variant is just so uh, contagious. It's a lot lighter in terms of the, of the severity of the virus, but it is very contagious. So we want to be careful. Wear a mask if you're going to come Sunday. Wear it to your seat. You can take it off once you sit down. Social distancing, please stay spread apart. No shaking hands and hugging. If you can please avoid that. Now, if you are sick or anybody in your house is sick or even partially <laughs> remotely sick, please err on the safe side. It's okay. This is, this is just for a few weeks. Please stay home in the comfort of your home, own home and watch the live stream. We will continue to live stream. So uh, starting this Sunday, Sunday nights and Wednesday nights will be in person with restrictions, and that restriction mainly being please wear a mask in if you're sick, if you, if you have been in contact with anybody that has COVID within the last week or so, please err on the safe side and stay home. Bless you guys. We're going to continue to monitor it that way through the end of January and then just kind of reset, see where we are at the end of January. Does that sound like a deal? Um, okay, let's move on. Let me pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We thank you for this study. Thank you that, for your word that we're about to dive into and God, we just, uh, let me just give you this whole thing, Lord. This, uh, I don't like to start off Bible studies with that kind of stuff, Lord, but uh, it's important that we all understand and have an intentional plan, Lord. I pray that you continue giving us wisdom as we uh, plow through this, Lord, and, and navigate through these waters that we're in these days. Uh, we want to do it with excellence. We want to do it with um, uh, uh, beyond reproach and above reproach, Lord. We want to have people's uh, uh, health as the main concern, and uh, do our due diligence, Lord. Just pray, God, you continue to give us wisdom. Be with us tonight, Lord, as we dive into your word, God. Another exciting night as we, uh, uh, as your word comes alive to us, Lord. I pray, God, you uh, bless this, Pastor Lord, and get me another way if you need to, Lord, because I want your will to be done tonight. Have, have your way in it all, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Whew. Bless you guys. Glad you're with us. Uh, hope you're comfortable at home. Uh, I am a little bit more casual than usual, so I'm wearing some sweatpants. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna have a good time tonight. I believe that you'll get a lot out of uh, tonight's study. So we're in chapter 27 of the book of Acts tonight. A little um, segue into it is that we started at chapter 25. We started seeing Paul. Uh, interacting with the Roman government. He, he was accused by some Jewish leaders of, of, um, of basically uh, maligning the, the Jewish faith, the Jewish traditions. He was accused of starting an insurrection. All these were false accusations, but those accusations made their way back to the Roman governor of that region. His name was Felix, if you recall. Felix, however, he was a politician first before he was a governor, I think, and he, he just wanted to do what was going to make him look good to his constituents, and uh, so he kept Paul on house arrest for two years, and this appeased the Jewish leaders that kept Paul off the street, so he wasn't out preaching the gospel, but at the same time, he wasn't, it didn't force his hand uh, into doing anything with Paul. Meanwhile, Felix was replaced by another Roman governor named Festus, who was not like Felix. He did want to get some things done. He saw that this guy, Paul, had been on house arrest. And in other words, he was kind of on the books, as it were, 
for more than two years. That's ridiculous. Let's get this thing taken care of. And so he did meet with Paul. <coughs> in fact, um, he brought in a king uh, from a, in a surrounding area named King Agrippa, who was well-versed in the Jewish traditions. He brought him in to listen to this case. That's what we looked at last week. Tonight, we're going to see now Paul getting ready to start the journey to be transferred to Rome because in this whole uh, discourse with, with him and, and, and uh, Felix and then Festus, Paul appealed to Caesar, and that was a right that he had as a Roman citizen. And so this is indeed about to happen now in Acts 27. So let's pick it up at verse 1. It says, when it was decided that we would sail for Italy, so before I go any further, notice it says we, so we being Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. So when he says we, that means he himself has rejoined Paul. So he's part of this entourage. Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the imperial regiment. We boarded a ship from Adramitium, about to sail for uh, that was about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia. We put out to sail to sea. Okay, so here you see on this map. I don't know if you can see it really well, but uh, over on the on the right side is where the journey begins. Jerusalem's down there, uh, just above where it says Judea. Uh, so they're about to set sail from that area. Uh, on the right, and go all the way over on the left, and that's that's the path of the journey. <clears throat> and it says here, let's see, I lost my place here. Uh, we put out to sea. Arista, Arista, Arist, <laughs> Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. Boy, that's a lot of tongue t- tongue twisting going on there. The next day, we landed uh, at. Sidon. So here's a map again. So um, if Sidon there is still over on the right. Um, you can kind of see it up there. It's still on the. It's in this area of Syria. So that's where they are right there. And Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. So let's stop right there for a moment. So was it a coincidence that Paul was put in charge or put in the watch of a Roman centurion who would show him favor? I mean, did you notice how it's worded there? It says uh, that he was, he was put under the care of this man, this centurion named Julius. This guy belonged to the imperial regiment. I mean, this was a, this was a heavy hitter in the Roman structure. And yet it says here the next day, Julius, in kindness to Paul, why did he? Why was he kind to Paul? He didn't owe Paul anything. But in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. So this is an important point. Again, I say, was it just coincidence that Paul was put in, in, uh, in the watch of a Roman centurion who would show him favor? Was this guy Julius just a really, really super nice guy, maybe a pushover? I doubt it. He was a centurion. Only the best and top and the most loyal Roman soldiers made the rank of centurion. What did a centurion mean? Centurion meant he had 100 Roman soldiers under him, thus the name centurion. And it says here that this not only was he a centurion, but he belonged to the imperial regiment. That's one of the highest ranking uh, places that, uh, uh, areas that you can uh, be a Roman soldier uh, in the Roman structure. So this was no pushover, yet it said that he gave Paul favor. So was this guy, it just was he just a nice guy, or was perhaps God really the one granting favor? And that's the question we need to ask ourselves because the truth of the matter is, look at this note on the screen here. As believers, we receive God's favor, and sometimes that favor is displayed through the favor of an unwitting person. This is a good point. I believe this is what's going on here. I mean, how 
you know, if I had people here, I'd, I'd have a little discussion right now. God's favor. Let's talk about God's favor. How is God's favor displaced and dispensed or displayed and dispensed in our lives? Well, through one area is spiritual blessing. I mean, there's no greater favor that we have experienced than forgiveness of our sins, than adoption into his family, than the fact that he calls us his own and he tells us to cry out in that spirit that he gave us. That spirit says, cry out, Abba, Father. That's favor right there. So spiritual blessing for sure. How about, it? How about we, God's favor is displayed when, we, when he endows us to do what we couldn't have done on our own? We get favor in a situation. We get favor in an in a endeavor that we're uh, trying to, uh, to embark on. We, get, we experience God's favor through circumstances, surely. We pray about a situation, and then there's a break in, in the action, and, and there's an answer, apparently, to our prayer. That's God's favor. But he also, and I've experienced this, God shows his favor through others, through people. You better believe it. And I said earlier, unwitting people, because that person usually doesn't even realize they were being used of God. Have you ever experienced this in your life? I have. And by the way, God can use believers and non-believers or unbelievers. You better believe he can. I've I've. If I had time, I would tell you a few stories of my own life of when God used unbelievers that did not even acknowledge him to show me favor. And I knew that because I knew I was in a God moment. It was an answer to prayer. So that's God's part. What's well, our part? Well, the best way to position yourself for God's favor, belief and obedience. You knew I was going there. We've been talking about that so much lately. That's how we position ourselves and partner with God in the miracle. And in this case, we're talking about the dispensing of his favor in our lives. It's like, how do I do that? What do, how do I get his favor? How do I trigger that? Well, belief and obedience is a good way to start. Let's get back to the story. Verse 4 says, From there we put out to sea again and passed to the lee of Cyprus. So what is a lee? A lee is the side, in this case, of a body of land, the side that was sheltered from the wind. So maybe you've heard the sea term called leeward. Um, that's the side that's sheltered from the wind. So they passed to the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. So again, now I'm going to show this map again. Now they're in the, the, the lee of Cyprus. So they've turned left, and now they're kind of heading over. You might be able to see that on the screen. Cyprus is that island that is uh, there on the right. So now they're making that passageway in that channel uh, between the island and the mainland. Verse 5, when we had sailed against the open sea off the coast of Cilicia, and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. So let's take a look at that. So they kept on going past Cyprus, and now they're back on the mainland there in Lycia or Lycia, however it's pronounced. Verse 6, there were, cent there were centurion found, excuse me, excuse me, there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off of, and I don't know how to pronounce this, Sindus maybe? Maybe we'll just go with that. That's probably not right. <laughs> when the wind did allow us, or excuse me, when the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the lee of Crete opposite Salmoni. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens. By the way, another version says safe havens near the town of Lacia. So 
again, here we are on the map, uh, that Fair Havens, now they've gone from the mainland over to the left. Now we're basically in the middle of this map. You see the island of Crete there, and Fair Havens is on the south side of that island. Um, the idea being that that's a haven uh, supposedly protected from the winds, uh, but as we'll see that that wasn't necessarily the case. Moving on, verse 9, much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. Okay, why is Luke bringing that up? What's that? What's the Day of Atonement? Or Yom Kippur, by the way. Day of Atonement is Yom Kippur. What has that got to do with anything? Well, Yom Kippur, or Day of Atonement, takes place in the fall, usually around September, sometimes into October, so basically what Luke was saying was winter was approaching. So that's what was going on. They're sailing at a time when it's a little sketchy to be out there. Moving on. So, so Paul warned them in verse 10. Look at this. Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. Wow. Wow. Chill out, Paul. I'm sure that wasn't a popular thing to say. So what was going on here? Was Paul giving some kind of supernatural revelation? Maybe. But we also know that Paul had a lot of sailing experience in this area with all of his missionary trips. I've shown maps of his three different missionary trips as we've gone through the book of Acts. And he was all over the place there in, in, the, uh, in that region, sailing back and forth. So he had a lot of experience with this. And look what he says in 2 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 25. He says, Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. That pretty much says it all right there. But notice how many references there that he's made to things going on in the sea. When it comes to things of the sea, I think Paul was saying, hey, man, I've been there and done that. Three times he was shipwrecked. He spent the night in open sea constantly on the move, in danger at sea. So he knew what he was talking about. But maybe, I don't know, was it, was it more than that? Was he just expressing an opinion based on his experience? Or was this maybe a, a, a message from the Lord? I don't, we don't know. Maybe we'll see. Verse 11. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, wintering in means basically they would go into a safe harbor and ride it out and stay for the winter uh, wait and wait till uh, the winter had passed so they could sail again. And so oftentimes ships, by the way, this ship that Paul is on is holding roughly around 300 people. It's a big ship. And Oftentimes, when, when ships would go into harbor and they would call what they would call winter, that meant that the that everybody would disembark and go inland and go into town and basically spend a few months and wait until it was safe to go back out. So they oftentimes wanted to winter in cities that had a lot of resources and a lot of things for them to do and food to eat and places to get shelter and uh, a roof over their heads and food and whatnot. So it says, since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. So I did a little study on that. Turns out that this safe haven really wasn't so much of a safe haven. It was kind of a misnomer because it really wasn't all that protected from the open sea and the storms. So they decided to move on. hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. So Phoenix 
is a is an area up uh, up on the other side, a little bit a little bit better protected. We'll see it when we show the map again. But um, it says this is the, this was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. So, well, they didn't listen to Paul, did they? Paul gave his opinion. They didn't listen to it. They're going to move on. They have their own ideas. They're going to they're going to go out back out into the open sea and go all the way over to Phoenix. Look at what verse 13 says. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity. So, ah, oh, the winds are changing. You know, hey, look, this is favorable. Let's go out and let's hit it. Let's set sail. Let's go. So they weighed anchor and sailed uh, along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. By the way, another version calls this wind a Euroclidon. Euroclidon, maybe you've heard that term before. Here's what it looks like. <laughs> this is a representation of a wave that would be typical in that Mediterranean Sea in a Euroclidon. So you can see that's a wave that uh, does not look too um, safe and friendly to a, to a ship that's out in the open sea. And then, of course, as the storm begins to turn, churn and churn, and this is what it uh, starts to look like. It, a, a Euroclidon was a notoriously strong and cold wind that, that blew from the northeast in the Mediterranean region, uh, mainly in the winter, by the way. So this is right on schedule. This is what you, know, you could expect this time of year. It just seemed like it was a little bit early. Kind of reminds me of that old Gordon Lightfoot song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. <laughs> they talked about when the gales of, the, of November came early. So that's exactly what's going on here. The gales of November or, or October, whatever it is, came early. And that, was, that was exactly what was happening. And a ship like that might have looked something like this out there in the open sea. It's probably a good representation of, of what they were up against right there because that, that is an artist's rendering of what the Mediterranean Sea would have looked like in that kind of storm. It doesn't look too pleasant to me. Verse 15. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it, and we were driven along. So there's a lot I could say about that. That's sailing terminology there. When you give way to the wind, it means you stop trying to fight it, and you just let the wind drive you. Verse 16 says, as we passed to the lee of a small island named Kata, We were hardly able to make the, uh, the lifeboat, also called a skiff. Maybe, you, maybe your version of your Bible says skiff. That's what a lifeboat is. It was, it was a small, a skiff was a small boat or raft that they would keep on a large ship like this to go inland, you know, like when they would uh, winter. That's what they used a skiff to take all the, the men to shore, or it could be used as a lifeboat. And in this case here, verse 16 says, as we pass to the lee um, of the small island called Kata, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. In other words, it was being battered. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Man, this thing's getting serious. Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor. Okay, well, what's lowering the seat anchor mean? That means they, were, they lowered it down to slow them down. <laughs> this wasn't to anchor and just stop, try to stop. They did this and to lower a, sh a sea anchor means they were trying to slow the ship down as much as they could. So they did that in order to let the ship be driven along. Verse 18 says, We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day, they began to throw the cargo overboard. I mean, this was a cargo ship among, as well as hauling 300 um, men in it. 
cargo most likely was grain and maybe some other things too. But uh, because of the route that this was on, scholars believe that this thing was full of grain. So it would have been extremely expensive. I mean, they were basically throwing over their payday overboard. That's how serious this was. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. I mean, now they're throwing out the tools, the, the extra supplies, the, the lines, the ropes, and all of that. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. So, it's been an interesting story up to this point. Showing the map, showing their route, showing the time of year, showing the, the tempest that came in, the storm, this northeaster that had come in, was battering them. And it says here, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. This is interesting to me. Remember, Luke is the one writing this. And he was there. He was part of the we that was giving up hope. <laughs> and by the way, so was Paul. The ship's owner, the sailors, the captain, the Roman soldiers, the other prisoners on board, everyone looked at the outward appearances of what was happening. There was no justification for hope. There was no leg to stand on for hope. They looked like they were goners, right? But remember, Paul, being led by the Spirit, knew that God would not lead him and them out there just to die. He knew he had a God-ordained moment coming with Caesar. He also had an appointment, as it were, a God-ordained meeting with the newly formed Roman Christian church and by the way, this relationship that he developed with them led to his first epistle in our Bible, the book of Romans. That had yet to happen. Guys, what I'm getting at, simply put, when we are led by the Spirit, we need not pay attention to the waves crashing around us. I want to say that again. When we are led by the Spirit, we need not pay attention to the waves crashing around us. I have not seen yet, and I've read the Bible cover to cover, I've not seen one story of where God led his people into defeat. Not one. And nowhere in my own life have I ever felt led by the Spirit to do something, and it ended up being a fail. Now, I did a lot of things on my own. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I did a lot of things on my own that led to failure. And most of my failures and the things that I were trying to recover from, from my own past, trust me, that was not God leading me. <laughs> God did not lead me to pick up that bottle and, and crawl into it for th 20 years and ruin my life. Most of my, all, I mean, all my bad decisions were for me. They're all, that's on me. But not once have we prayed about God's will in our marriage and my wife and I been led into failure. It's always been for the best. The Bible says we are more than conquerors. When we are led by the Spirit, guys, we need not pay attention to the waves. Now, this is good timing when you consider the hubbub and, 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 the, and all the stuff that just going on right now, we're all worn out by now by this pandemic. And then now we got this Omicron coming up and it's, and it's the most contagious variant yet. And, um, and, and it's like, oh man, you gotta be kidding me. You know what? It's so easy. It'd be so easy to just see the crashing of the waves around us and give up and say, what's the use? And maybe God's not going to work after all. No, no, no. We stay the course. We stay the course. That's exactly what I felt. God said to me when I came over this last Sunday to post signs on the two side doors that we were going to be taking off a week of uh, in-person meetings, I had a sense of dread because two years ago I did the same thing and I thought, oh, Lord, we're right back to where we were back in March of 2020. No, no, we're not. No, 
No, the Spirit told me, don't pay attention to the waves. Stay the course. I told you guys that this last Sunday, and that's what we're going to do, and that's what I believe Paul was doing here in this scene. Peter learned that same lesson in the familiar story of when the disciples were on a boat and the, the water was getting churned up pretty good. And they look out into the night and when they see Jesus walking on the water, it's just an amazing sight, surely. And here is good old Peter. Peter shouts out, Lord, if it's really you, then have me join you on the water. Come and join me, Peter, or Jesus replied. So Peter stepped out onto the water and began to walk toward Jesus. But when he realized how high the waves were, he became frightened and started to sink. Save me, Lord, he cried out. Jesus immediately stretched out his hand and lifted him up and said, What little faith you have. Why would you let doubt win? I showed this version of this verse right here because I like that last line. Why would you let doubt win? When we give in to despair, when we allow ourselves to lose hope, when we give in to fear and all of that, that's what we're doing. We're letting it win. We're letting doubt win. We're letting fear win. We're letting anxiety win. When the truth of the matter is all Peter had to do was keep his eyes focused on Jesus. Amen? So get this. When we are led by the Spirit, doubt cannot win. Doubt cannot win. Not won't win. Not maybe, gout cannot win. If you are focused on Jesus and don't take your eyes off of him, it doesn't matter what's going on around it. And I'll tell you what, that's a good word for me as a pastor because right now it's a bummer that I'm preaching and I'm speaking to an empty building. In, in the flesh, it feels like we took a step back, but I'm not going to look at the crashing waves. I'm going to focus on Jesus because it did not daunt him one bit. He is still on the move, and he is still going to do what he's going to do here in this church. This little minor setback isn't going to sway him one bit. I don't want to be swayed by it either. And getting back to Paul, in this story, Paul understood this concept because he's the one that wrote this in Romans 8. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? So hope, we're hoping for something that we don't see. If it's something that we can see and touch, then it really isn't hope. And he wrote this in 2 Corinthians 5, for we live by faith, not by sight. So indeed, we see a theme here in getting back to the story tonight. Verse 21, after they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. <laughs> here comes the I told you so. Coulda, woulda, shoulda, right? But I don't really get a sense of snarkiness. I don't think there's that going on here. I believe that Paul is just simply stating fact. Look, I told you this was going to happen. You didn't listen to me. And, and so you would have been spared all that, but here we are. Maybe now you'll listen to me <laughs> because I have heard from the Lord on this. See? And I started to think. In my own life, how do we react when we hear from the Lord? I mean, Paul could have gotten up on his high horse easily, but how do we react when we hear from the Lord? How do we react when we hear, when we're praying about something or God gives us a word in a situation? How do we react? It'd be so easy to get puffed up. Well, I heard from the Lord. Hey, I got a word from the Lord on this, you know? Listen, here's a good humble, this is a good way to react. The proper way to react when we hear from the Lord is to simply be amazed and grateful that God spoke and we heard. <laughs> That's it. God, you spoke and I heard. That's all that matters. It doesn't even matter about what you said. That's secondary. Thank you, Lord. And by the way, that's even when he gives us a no. <laughs> God spoke, we heard. How can you do any better than that? Verse 22, but now I urge you to keep up your courage, Paul continues, because not one of you will be lost. 
if only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the Lord, to whom I belong and, and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will be just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Okay, let's unpack this paragraph here as we kind of wrap up tonight. There are several important points I want to note. See, here in the scene, God sent an angel to comfort Paul. So that tells me that God loved Paul, for one thing, first and foremost. But secondly, it tells me that God is concerned about our circumstances. <laughs> God is not unaware of our circumstances. we got to get that. And he wanted to remind Paul that he was with him and that he need not give in to fear. In other words, don't let doubt win. <laughs> Just like Jesus said to Peter, don't let doubt win. And that's a great takeaway for us, guys. When we have God's presence, we need not give in to fear. David said that. I could go on and on and on about all the Psalms, but the one that immediately comes to mind is, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. Why? Because you are with me. God's difference or God's presence is the difference maker, guys. Also notice in this story that we just read, Paul is now, after being encouraged by the Spirit through this angel, is now encouraging others. By the way, he had some credibility with them now because he was right earlier about not going out to sea, <laughs> right? Now he was encouraging the others. So that's a good takeaway for us. Get this, when the Spirit encourages us, we should encourage others. We're supposed to be just dispensers of the grace that we are received ourselves, guys. As God encourages us, we should therefore encourage others. That's good. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us, get this, in our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. What does that say? Hey, God gives you comfort so that you can turn, in turn, comfort somebody else with the comfort you just received. That's a good biblical concept. That's why it just plays out in a practical sense. God gave me grace. God did a miracle in my life, freed me from alcoholism. Who better to talk to somebody else that's riddled with alcoholism than I? And I can say, hey, he did it for me. He can do it for you exactly what we see Paul doing here. The angel showed up, encouraged him. He's turning around and encouraging others. Also, notice that the angel told him that they would be saved, but they would be shipwrecked. See, guys, we always have God's promises. He will help us and never abandon us, but that doesn't always mean we won't experience suffering. But even in the suffering, there's a reason for it, right? Right? Paul wrote in Romans 5, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also get this glory in our sufferings. What? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope does not just put us to shame. Another version said, hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given to us. So there's a reason even in the suffering. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So God is always with us. He's always with us working in our situation. We have all of his promises, but he never, he never promised that we wouldn't suffer at times. 
But he also, but he did promise that after that suffering that he himself would restore us. And there was a reason for the suffering. See, there's suffering. There's a reason for our sufferings, guys. Suffering produces perseverance. What's perseverance? That's stick to itiveness. That's that grit that we have that wants to keep us in there fighting and not giving up. You wouldn't have gotten that if you didn't suffer at some point and let God and where God come in, can come in and show himself faithful, faithful and you were stronger for it. And then once we have that perseverance, perseverance develops character. Character, what's that? Character is who you are when no one's looking. Your reputation is who people think you are. Your character is who God knows you are. And that is developed through the perseverance that was a product of the suffering. So we should not always wish away our seasons, God. Instead, we should say, God, do in me everything you need to do during this season. And at the end of the, at the end product of character is hope. And hope does not disappoint. Praise God for that. And by the way, all these that I just read were written by Paul. <laughs> so he was speaking from experience. In other words, God is, he's saying in all of this, hey, guys, God is faithful. In fact, let's all say that for, the, for those at home watching, I'm just about to wrap up here. I know I'm going a little bit longer than usual. Let's say this together. God is faithful. Amen. Claim that. Take that. Make that part of, your, of what you stand on as a believer and then getting back to our original text, note that Paul says in verse 25, so keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that he will, that it will happen just as he told me. In other words, Paul said this, Paul was saying this, God said it, I believe it. Now that's faith right there in a simplistic, simplistic, simplistic sense. God said it, I believe it. That's it. And by the way, here's another scripture that Paul wrote. He said, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave, God, gave glory to God. Get this, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Being fully persuaded. Are we fully persuaded? Are we fully persuaded that God's still on his throne even in this mess that we're in right now? Is he, are we fully persuaded that he's still going to bring revival to this church? Are we still fully persuaded that he's going to move in our relationships, in our marriages, in our homes? Are we fully persuaded as we pray for our loved ones, as we pray for our unsaved loved ones, as we pray for healings in this place, are we fully persuaded we will indeed see breakout and breakthrough in this church? Look what else Paul said to Timothy. He said, because I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. I have the old version memorized, and I know in whom I believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. Get that, persuaded. There's that word persuaded again. Paul was persuaded. Abraham was persuaded. Even though Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was around 90, he was persuaded that God promised him that they were going to have a son. Even though it was physically impossible, he was not daunted at all in his faith because he was persuaded and convinced that God could and would do what he said he was going to do. Now, that's faith. That's standing in faith. That's standing in hope. That's standing in belief and obedience, guys. That's positioning ourselves for the great things that God wants to do. But notice Paul said, I know whom I have believed. In other words, he wasn't standing on Scripture. It wasn't standing on words. He knew the author of the Scripture. In other words, he was standing in God's 
character, as we stand in God's character, that he is who he says he is, guys, that is what is going to position us for the, 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 the next level that God wants us to take us to. We're not even standing on his word. Even Jesus said we're not supposed to worship Scripture per se. Per se. We're supposed to worship the author of the Scripture. And Paul is saying, hey, I know Scripture, but more than that, I know the author of the Scripture. And because of that personal relationship, because I know whom in whom I have believed, because of that, I am persuaded and convinced that he is able to do what he said he was going to do. Amen? Amen. That's a good word for us tonight. It's a good word for us where we are right now in this, right now in this position that we are in with all that's going on right now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, God, for the conviction and the power in which your word is delivered. God, there's power in the word of God. There's power, Lord, in the name of Jesus. There's power, Lord, when your presence is felt in a manifest way, Lord, and we feel that power right now. We're not standing on my words. We're standing on you, God, and your promises, your character, who you are, Lord. And we believe, like Paul, we want to be persuaded that you are able to, to, to work right in the middle of this, all this pandemic, all of this mess, Lord. We're going to see something mighty and miraculous happen in our church and our families and our homes. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys. Love you. Hope you got something from tonight. Have a good night.